Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we are going to start, even if uh, some people are still joining, but we can at least uh, kick, us, uh, kick off this, uh, this session. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Maitre. I'm a research fellow at the Foundation for Strategic Research. The FRS is a leading security and defense uh, oriented think tank based in Paris. We are grateful to be organizing uh, this event with the support of the European Union. Uh, since 2008, the EU has been promoting the Hague Code of Conduct against the proliferation of ballistic missiles and has trusted the FRS to implement this program. So as part of this project, we are happy to organize outreach events, uh, but also to publish papers that aim at nourishing reflections on the code, but also on missile proliferation uh, more generally. So today we're going to discuss the latest pa uh, paper we have been uh, publishing with its author, uh, Katarzyna Kubiak. Uh, Katarzyna is a senior policy fellow on nuclear arms control uh, uh, at the European Leadership Network. Actually, it's her uh, last days in this uh, position before joining uh, the OSCE. Uh, previously, she was a postdoc fellow at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies, and she also worked as an associate at the uh, SWP and the uh, IFSH in, in Germany. Uh, following her PhD, thesis on NATO, nuclear extended deterrence. Uh, her research areas include nuclear arms control, non-proliferation, disarmament, uh, missile defense, and translating how new technologies, uh, what impact they can have on nuclear uh, decision making. So Katarzyna's uh, paper is entitled uh, Harnessing Transparency Potential for Missile uh, Non-Proliferation. It's, of course, a very topical uh, subject, uh, very relevant as we look at recent uh, developments in the field of missiles. Uh, we can recall, for instance, that this summer the arms control community uh, followed very closely uh, the disclosure by think tank experts uh, that China was building more than 100 uh, uh, missile ICBM silos uh, in the western provinces. Uh, and it's something that was um, displayed, disclosed using open source uh, satellite imagery. Uh, we had the kind of same uh, process uh, this year to um, evoke a, a new uh, missile base that North Korea would be uh, building. So in this paper, uh, Katarzyna is uh, really exploring uh, the different ways in which uh, open source information and new technologies uh, uh, and, and the new access to uh, technology can be mobilized uh, to obtain information on missile development, uh, deployment and testing uh, an aspect that is, of course, especially relevant for the object of the Hague Code of, Hague Code of Conduct. So we're going to let uh, Katarzyna give us the main findings uh, of her research. And then uh, Melissa Hanham has kindly agreed to comment and give perspectives on this paper and the issues at, at stake. Uh, Melissa is currently an independent expert. Previously, she was the Deputy Director uh, of the Open Nuclear Network and Director of the Datayo Project at One Earth Future Foundation. Melissa is a, a renowned expert uh, on open source intelligence, especially focused on the monitoring and verification of international arms control agreements using open source evidence. And before we actually dig in in our con uh, discussion, I will give the floor to Narcisa Vladulescu, who is uh, the chair of the Working Party on Non-Proliferation at the European Union Action Service. Uh, and uh, Narcisa is going to recall the commitment of the EU uh, in support of the Hague Code of Conduct and its efforts to, to raise awareness on uh, ballistic missile proliferation. So Narcisa, I'm going to be happy to give you the floor. I will just uh, recall three uh, practical information uh, before we start. Uh, first, as you may have been notified, this event is on the record and will be broadcasted on our webpage in a few days. Second, we will have a Q&A session uh, at the end, so please feel free to send your comments, your questions, uh, as, uh, as of now, in the written form, in the Q&A tab to all panelists. This session is going to last one hour, so it's going to go pretty fast. So really uh, feel free to, to send uh, remarks as they, as they come. And third, of course, uh, Katarzyna's paper is available for download on our website, which has been entirely redesigned. So uh, we are quite uh, proud of it. Uh, please feel free to browse it, to read all our information about the program or uh, other publications. Uh, on this, uh, on this uh, new uh, webpage uh, that is, I think, uh, right now in the, in the chat. 
So with that, I'm happy to, to turn for, uh, to Narcissa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, very nice to be here today with you and uh, Katarzyna and Melissa. And I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to share a few remarks on behalf of the European External Action Service. Today's webinar, as well as the research paper by Katarzyna Kubiak, as you just mentioned, on the issue of uh, harnessing transparency potential for missile non-proliferation, are part of a long-standing cooperation between the EU and the FRS within a project to promote the universalization, implementation, and efficient functioning of the Hague Code of Conduct. As you also mentioned, since 2008, the FRS has been implementing five consecutive projects funded by the European Union. The current one is uh, based on a council conclusion from 20, sorry, council decision from 2017, running into uh, early next year. With a funding of uh, approximately 2 million euro, it focuses on outreach activities, expert meetings, research papers, and regional awareness sessions on the code. Only yesterday, as you just said, uh, the FRS launched a new webpage dedicated uh, to this project. So I would like to thank uh, you, uh, your team, uh, the whole uh, FRS uh, colleagues for their fantastic engagement, tireless work and high degree of expertise within our joint collaboration in support of HCOC. This year, as you well know, uh, will mark the 20th anniversary of the Hague Code of Conduct. As such, we are currently at an important moment to take stock of where we are with the code, but also to reflect on what uh, lays ahead. The EU also intends to mark this anniversary together with the member states and in collaboration with the FRS to further strengthen its outreach to those states who, that have not yet joined the code in order for them to do so. The EU support for the, whole, for the Hague Code of Conduct is longstanding, as I said, being the only multilateral instrument aiming at both preventing ballistic missile proliferation and increasing transparency about ballistic missile and space launch vehicle programs of the subscribing states. The EU regularly calls on all states, which have not yet done so, to subscribe to HCOC and to all subscribing states to fully implement their commitments, especially by timely and regular exchange of pre-launch notifications on ballistic missiles and space vehicle launches and test flights. In these turbulent times, when the relating pace and technological development of missile programs increasingly appear as a destabilizing factor in various regions of the world, the HCO continues to encourage restraint and plays an important role in building confidence for the benefit of global peace and security. Today's webinar focuses on a wealth of information on missile-related issues that is currently available through affordable, commercial, and open-source monitoring capabilities. The world has indeed changed much since uh, the Hague Code of Conduct was agreed upon 20 years ago, yet the code remains still highly relevant. I am personally convinced that the code will continue to play a key role in our toolbox, not only as a tool for information sharing, but also as a transparency and confidence building mechanism. And with that, I would like to wish you a successful and inspiring workshop. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Narcissa, um, and of course, many thanks uh, to the EU for its uh, renewed support that allows us to conduct uh, today's events, among many other things. Uh, I'm now happy to, to give the floor to Katarzyna, who is going to present to us uh, the, the main findings really of her uh, research. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you, Narcisa, for this uh, kind introduction and also uh, for uh, for the funding um, uh, for funding this uh, important project. Um, and I also want to thank uh, the FRS and especially Emmanuel uh, for the invitation to write this paper and for the opportunity to present it uh, to a broader audience um, today. So um, the key message uh, I basically want to make today is that tons of data are out there, uh, tools to analyze the data are out there, and people eager to both use the tools and analyze the data are out there, but they remain heavily uh, underutilized. 
Uh, yet for states that use data generated uh, by national technical means, which they cannot always disclose, and for states without national technical means, using these untapped resources could create more and more actionable intelligence. So let me give you a story and Emmanuel already um, kind of alluded to it. So last year, uh, several groups of independent researchers uncovered new nuclear missile silos and underground tunnels under construction at several locations in China. These revelations were based on satellite imagery, but the images didn't come from governmental intelligence communities. Instead, they were collected using privately owned and operated commercial satellites and analyzed at think tanks, academia, and by private analysts. Well, actually, the US Strategic Command seemed pretty relieved that the cat was out of the bag when it wrote on Twitter that the public has discovered what we've been saying all along. While there might be many reasons why the US government did not disclose this evidence to the public itself, in order to substantiate earlier warnings by officials about rapid advances in Chinese nuclear capabilities. This case is one of many examples that the times when information was the exclusive purview of governments are over. And obviously information is crucial for any non-proliferation effort. We live in times in which information is out there and it's growing every day. For example, each day humanity generates 500 million tweets, almost 300 billion emails and, seven, and 4 million gigabytes of Facebook data. For those of you who like me are more visual, um, at the beginning of 2020, so two years ago, the number of bytes in the digital universe was 40 times bigger than the number of stars in the observable, uh, in the observable universe. So today, the challenge is less to find a needle in a haystack, but rather that you have an entire haystack of needles that you need to structure. And the search often involves tapping different data sources and not always obvious ones. For example, Jeffrey Lewis and Catherine Dill uh, from CNS uh, discovered a Chinese attempt to construct an underground nuclear reactor during the 60s and 70s using a retired Chinese professor's memoirs and pictures on social media. On another occasion, Jeffrey Lewis located the Chinese Korla missile test complex, whose existence the Chinese uh, did not acknowledge at this time, by cross-referencing information from satellite uh, images with WikiLeaks, press accounts, and selfies posted on social media by Chinese military unit alumni. Well, you ask, what does this mean for governments? With more technologies available to a broader public and more organizations and individuals involved in search and monitoring activities, increased transparency seems unavoidable. And this trickles through into the missile non-proliferation domain. States will find it increasingly difficult to hide or lie about their missile programs. States will become less able to manage the disclosure of sensitive information either about their own programs or the programs of other states. Governments will likely see more disclosures happening and feel more pressure to react to them. Information asymmetries between governments and their publics will go down and contradictions between what leaders claim and the realities on the ground will become eminent. And transparency will hold decision makers increasingly accountable and shape public preferences. At the same time, shadow monitoring could generate publicly shareable, traceable, and as credible evidence. Transparency generated by civil society can, for example, back up findings governments cannot disclose, can substantiate accusations and claims on missile activities of other states uh, expressed without evidence, can get a better understanding of the situation on the ground 
in less frequently looked at spots on the globe or disputed territories and can empower states that do not possess sophisticated and expensive national technical means today. Well, so far, the discovery of what seems like several ICBMs missile silo fields under construction in China prompted Admiral Charles Richard, the commander of US Stratcom to say, if you enjoy looking at commercial satellite imagery, can you keep looking? Normally, we pay people to do it. Well, it's one way to look at this. Another is to be more rigorous in thinking about how one could benefit from the democratization of knowledge, access to data sources, and from the battalions of civil enthusiasts eager to spend hours investigating different triggers, exploring data sources, and developing new tools um, out of curiosity. So if you are responsible for the Hague Code of Conduct in your government, uh, next to providing tangible deliverables as per the code's text, you may ask yourself, what more can I do to develop bilateral or regional transparency measures, as well as involve in global and regional, multilateral, bilateral, and national endeavors to curb ballistic missile proliferation? And because the code gives the signatory states a vast room for maneuver, one question you could ask is how to apply existing resources more efficiently and systematically to supplement governmental monitoring activities. For states that do not own sophisticated technical means like satellites, this offers a chance to establish their own or join intelligence sources using open source and commercially available resources. The ability to undertake independent monitoring opens up new avenues to actively participate in non-proliferation efforts and lessens the reliance on foreign data or intelligence provision. To harness the full potential of available resources and information, governments and the private sector need to consider engaging empowering and supporting the non-governmental sector. Engagement happens only if governments accept the value added of societal monitoring. Empowerment means entrusting non-governmental actors to monitor activities. And support can range from financing data and software procurement and in-house development, to providing access to area surveillance data and closed loop data from military satellites, drones, planes, and so forth. But it also can include establishing and financing educational curricula aimed at training a strong and diverse workforce and building bridges between disciplines. Creating governmental points of contact for scientists would allow better information circulation. So far, civil society organizations often need to operate through trusted individuals to reach to decision makers. And more financing could possibly widen the geographical scope of monitoring activities currently limited to both in scope and geography to Iran, North Korea, and China. Well, obviously, you may ask yourself if uh, you know increased transparency could render the code useless. You know, if information is out there and available to anybody, what is the value of sticking or subscribing uh, to a formal mechanism that aims at increasing transparency? Um, can states be convinced that HCOG remains a crucial way of gaining information if they can, you know, if they can get it from other sources? Um, can states be convinced that the information they share is important for stability if everybody has access to it? Um, I feel that, first of all, um, the code is indeed about multilateral transparency, but it equally is about confidence building in um, measures. And this is a part that, you know, transparency cannot uh, serve. Secondly, uh, we are not yet at the point where data gives us a full picture on the ground. There are still um, many technological and resource related obstacles to generating full transparency. This obviously buys time for the subscribing states to think about how they would want to approach and possibly harness 
greater transparency in the future, especially as it is not a question of if, but rather when. And thirdly, more transparency can indeed strengthen the code. Transparency cannot act as a substitute for political will and the need for consensus building. Um, it can open doors, but it will not solve disagreements or elevate concerns. Having the means to generate transparency does not automatically solve non-proliferation problems. Uh, the code offers a closed door and safe space to um, create an official narrative, which constitutes you know, a shared basis um, for discussion between states. And it offers a platform for raising and addressing concerns about specific missile related activities, exchanging official information and discussing non uh, official information as well. So it allows states to put a collective stamp on the information uh, gathered. And at the end, it's really about framing political processes to take advantage of transparency. And I will stop by this and I would welcome Melissa's comments and then I'm looking forward to the voices from the audience. Thank you so much. Many thanks uh, first for I, the, the paper, which I think is extremely rich, uh, very interesting and uh, uh, touching questions that are extremely relevant. And also for taking the time in, in your presentation today to uh, emphasize this question that was a little bit something we thought of at the beginning when we uh, started thinking about the topic of the paper. Uh, information is out there. Could it threaten the code at some point or, or will it be uh, complementary and kind of reinforce the institutional mechanism that uh, exists? And I think you ha had a very convincing uh, arguments to, to show that it can really uh, be um, reinforcing the, the mechanism of the codes with something which is more official, where uh, states can have their narratives, but can also use some information to kind of challenge or uh, comment uh, what they can hear in, in this forum. So now I will give the floor to uh, Melissa for her feedback and comments, uh, questions maybe, uh, and then we'll take uh, questions from the audience. Melissa, please. Thank you, Emmanuel and Lorian, for in the invitation to speak today. And uh, thank you to Narcisa for the foresight to fund such uh, forward looking work. And particularly thanks to Katarzyna for writing a tremendous and prescient paper on the subject matter. Um, I think the hate code of conduct is sometimes overlooked uh, among various arms control arrangements. And so I, I really appreciate the attention to this particular subject and the view to which Katarzyna has, has uh, um, marshaled her, her research towards. Um, for those of you who already know me, you know that open source intelligence is something that's very near and dear to my heart. And I think we're seeing uh, a sea change just in my uh, career so far from a first phase of open source where people were just learning, is this even possible? Can I, sitting with a laptop in my living room, gather enough information to make a national security finding that is uh, important, relevant, and uh, worthy of attention? And now I think we're seeing a second wave, just the beginnings of a second wave, where we professionalize, utilize this information and in, in, in a systemic way that improves arms control situations. And so I think the, um, the work of Katarzyna is very important in uh, connecting governments with what has been happening for the last 10 or so years and helping governments pivot towards the next era of open source intelligence. Um, her first uh, point that I wanted to draw attention to is that this is not stoppable anymore. There are governments perhaps who feel uncomfortable or challenged that individual citizens from anywhere in the world with an internet connection can begin to piece together this information like detectives and make relevant policy information available to the press and the global public. Um, there were um, many countries who questioned this, who felt uncomfortable by this, there still are, but 
um, this is not, it is no longer possible to put the genie back in the bottle. So in order for governments to harness this information and use it in a positive way, governments are now uh, in the position of funding, supporting the work of individuals and uh, non-state non uh, groups to do this work ethically, accurately, effectively, and systematically in a way that is helpful rather than harmful. And um, as we're seeing uh, the proliferation of information, um, and as Katarzyna uh, pointed out, we have you know, haystacks and we have needles and we have haystacks full of needles and we have multiple haystacks of needles of information, we're also seeing a proliferation of actors. And so governments need to begin to understand which actors are acting in the best interest of arms control. Um, they need to weed out disinformation and misinformation, and they need to also understand which actors are qualified, um, effective, and um, ethical in their work. And so, um, you know, while I think the Hague Code of Conduct can benefit from the transparency that is happening, I also want to touch upon ways in which governments can uh, professionalize the tradecraft that is growing outside of states now. And um, this, you know, sorry, Narcisa, this involves more funding and more support and uh, more uh, legal um, uh, activities uh, that support uh, the information transfer from one state to another. Um, as Katarzyna already pointed out, this is very democratizing for states that don't have national technical means, um, for um, states that want to be on a more level playing field. So there's obvious benefit to those states. But for those states who already have national technical means, perhaps already have a lot of voices, um, for example, um, you know, I, I see Catherine Dill is in the audience. I've worked with her and others to create online communities of open source enthusiasts to connect them with data. And in the background, we were tracking where these people come from and um, you know, where they're logging in from and so on. And right now the voices of these people are primarily coming from the US and the UK. They're primarily men and they're primarily young. And so in order to have a uh, really excellent uh, information product, I, I would argue we need to diversify those kinds of people. We need more languages, we need more local knowledge, and we need more um, experiences, technical, cultural, and otherwise, to have the best information product that is possible, is the most usable. And so we really need to shift the culture of this being something that is done by you know, an American man, 26 years old, uh, to uh, a, a person who's sitting in any country um, protecting or um, understanding information from their own culture, their own language, um, in order for this to be uh, effective and, and further democratized. Um, so uh, funders in the EU and the US and elsewhere should empower um, other countries that are still evolving open source capabilities to grow the human capital um, that do the analysis on these. And at the same time, we need to prepare um, the legal uh, export control um, and sort of uh, underlying policy to allow universities and uh, nonprofits and civil society to have access to information and share it effectively and legally. Otherwise, we put uh, individuals in the difficult position of whether they can or should purchase stolen data, leaked data. Um, we, we, we force those individuals into situations where they are unable to share satellite imagery with people who actually have the most knowledge of what's happening. And we make the licensing costs and the access to data very difficult for people to do a good job. 
um, this is still remains uh, the purview of governments. And so um, I think it's important for governments who understand that um, this is happening, uh, this phenomenon is happening to now give the tools, uh, the training and the, um, uh, the, the financing necessary to make it effective. Um, I think that um, Katarzyna has put together a really excellent uh, overview of some of the, of the issues. The other area that I would also like to touch on are some of the technical um, advantages of data fusion, as she covered in her paper, and to highlight how this is continually evolving. And so with it, um, you know, with these technical capabilities become legal questions for states as well. And so, um, you know, she spent a lot of her time uh, focusing on the satellite imagery capabilities that are available, um, but we're also seeing a massive um, uh, improvements in accessibility on machine learning and um, artificial intelligence that can help analysts sift through the overwhelmingly large amount of data that is now available. And um, as universities in particular have access to better and better machine learning tools, um, there will be uh, an opportunity to harness those, um, but there will also be uh, questions of how can people build trust and understand the mathematical underpinnings of a machine learning algorithm, for example. So um, when I talk about machine learning, this can be done in imagery, just as um, we've already discussed. You can do things that can be uh, identified as objects. You can fuse data with topographical information, population centers, um, proximity to electricity or bodies of water, all to give you a picture of where a type of facility might exist or the turning radius of a certain truck that carries a missile and so on and so forth. And all these tools can be helpful. Um, in addition, text, uh, scientific journals, um, networks of human scientists on LinkedIn or other platforms, all of these types of things can be sifted through just as a picture can be. And it is more difficult for humans uh, to sift through this type of data because it is so massive. But um, for example, you can do um, a simple off the shelf, widely accepted and understood machine learning algorithms on text to identify um, positive and negative sentiments, to make a network map of the names or the places involved, and for topic modeling related to various subjects that can come in huge reams of data, like all the news of a country in a day. And this is becoming more and more capable. Um, we can also do network mapping of scientific journals to find out which technologies are showing up in our non-proliferation areas of concern. So as new materials are tested, new energy, energetic uh, materials are tested, uh, new um, uh, capabilities for a light airframe of a missile, for example, all of these um, patents or all of these scientific peer-reviewed journal articles can be harnessed as a way of looking for where technology is developing uh, and how it's developing and who specifically is involved. Um, so as we, um, as we grow those capabilities, questions about privacy, questions about export control of data, all become uh, the next round of questions we have to answer um, in how we handle this information. And we've seen uh, non-state uh, civil society associations come down in a couple of different places. Um, some groups uh, definitely are of the ends justify the means where um, if, if they can stop uh, an activity or if they can draw attention to a danger, they do it. Others are very reluctant to publish, very um, fearful of legal repercussions of the data. And um, 
others may be sharing data privately directly with a government or with an, an international organization. And so um, leading the way on how to handle these dilemmas um, and increasing the ability for individuals to handle um, these types of, uh, of legal and ethical questions, I think is really the next phase of how we can grow and professionalize this new type of trade craft that is happening. Um, I want to leave time for lots of questions, and um, I, I will pause here for now. But um, I, again, I really wanted to thank everyone involved for uh, in the invitation and for being part of this. I'm very impressed with the work. And I also just have to say, because it is still so unusual, I think this is the first time I've ever been on an all-female panel <laughs> related to missiles anyways. So uh, thank you again for having me and I uh, look forward to the questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you also for em emphasizing uh, these legal questions, which are something that uh, are quite uh, important and uh, maybe not directly explored in the paper, but it, of course it, it raises those kind of uh, issues. So we have a number of questions. I'm going to try to um, uh, maybe uh, give you the, the, the main topics of the questions and then you can uh, choose a little bit what you want to address and, and um, try to group them maybe. Uh, so uh, a question we have is uh, uh, on the uh, existence, if we have information, of, of a similar interest on Russian and Chinese NGOs to monitor Western missile sites and weaponry. That is a, a question by uh, Plamen Pontev. Uh, we have a question also maybe on the limitations of this uh, open source uh, information here. Uh, uh, the, the question really uh, is about whether uh, these kind of tools can help uh, to um, check, for instance, if some uh, missiles are dual capable, what versions are, are deployed, uh, whether they ca carry conventional or WMD uh, warheads, uh, also whether or not uh, these techniques can be uh, used to check maritime missile activities. Um, we have also a number of questions uh, or a number of comments uh, on the uh, possibility to um, uh, have deception techniques used uh, and so this is something that I, I know, Katarzyna, you uh, treated to some extent in the paper, uh, what could be the mitigating factors also uh, to address the fact that some of these uh, means may be uh, used, utilized, uh, and, and that there might be uh, efforts to kind of temper the information that is available or the interpretation that is made with the uh, information. Uh, and I think I will stop there for the first batch and I will round the rest for the, for the next. Uh, I will give you the floor already at this stage to see if you have uh, comments or, or reactions. Uh, Katarzyna, if you want to start. Okay, um, thank you very much for the questions. And also thank you, Melissa, for this extremely interesting um, comments. Um, so maybe um, in terms of uh, limitations or um, kind of, um, factors that could make a misuse of open source data possible. I feel this is a very valid point. Uh, but again, we are not at a stage, you know, if the public has access to this data, but it, it has already access to this data and malicious use of this data will happen probably anyhow. Um, and obviously there already is a lot of noise out there and probably even more important therefore is to have some instances also in the you know um, a civil society space to be able to look at this noise and to make sense out, out of the noise so that you know the general public uh, when um, when facing a lot of information satellite pictures and so on has a place a source to, it can go to and basically verify, you know, the validity, credibility of the information and data used, for example. Uh, and obviously both the public community can be um, uh, prone to manipulation um, and the information that is out there can also, also become a proliferation factor um, in, in some cases. Um, I feel the measures that, you know, uh, 
both the society and the governments have to apply are the same as we are already applying for misinformation, disinformation. I mean, the type of problems which we approach are not new. It's just the amount of possibly uh, uh, manipulative or, or misused um, um, information and data will basically um, increase in number. Uh, on the technical questions like distinguishing warhead types, I would prefer to refer to maybe Melissa or, or if Catherine Dill is on, on the call, I feel these are people who are definitely much better in uh, responding to these technical issues. Thanks. Yeah, Melissa, you can go ahead. So, um, so I think, um, you know, regarding the question of misinformation and disinformation, the good news here is that it's the easiest thing to prove in the open source is misinformation and disinformation. Um, as soon as something is, because all the evidence is available to the public, um, the answer can be checked very quickly. So it is very hard to manufacture a false claim which cannot be proven almost immediately. The, the larger challenge we have is the overwhelmingness, uh the possibility of overwhelming the current number of humans involved in, in open source. So. Um, just to be clear, it's not, you know, if a fake image is posted as proof of something, that image can be disproven almost immediately using simple mathematics to show um, that this is a deep fake or, or something like that. Um, the, the challenge becomes if there are so many instances uh, that um, trustable sources can't um, disprove all of them quickly enough for the general public to start believing something uh, that is not true. But I don't really see a space for uh, this to be abused um, by an individual very successfully, or at least not for more than a few minutes or hours. Um, on the subject of uh, Russia and Chinese NGOs monitoring Western missile sites and weaponry, um, this is underdeveloped. Um, I do think that we need uh, people uh, in all countries to do this, and not because I think the West is necessarily abusing or lying about what it's doing, but because we need people to trust what the West is saying. And we can no longer assume that people will just take the word of the West. And I also think that China, Russia, and many other countries can benefit from a robust civil society that does this kind of work regardless. Um, and I do know people in Russia and China who do this work and do it very well, um, but uh, there are not yet a lot of um, systematized civil society think tanks or organizations that collectively do explicitly this type of work. And I would welcome that growing. Um, on the subject of uh, warheads, um, this is uh, this is a tough this is a tough question that I don't think open source has an answer for yet, and that's um, mostly around the uh, difficult the, the time frame of a missile launch. Basically, um, every state, uh, whether you're handling classified or unclassified information, has trouble discriminating whether a warhead is nuclear or non-nuclear when it's incoming. And this is inherently a, a, a destabilizing kind of situation. Open source cannot yet operate at that pace or that speed. We do not have space-based or ground-based sensors like a government um, does. Um, that being said, I think there can be confidence building measures that can be done in the months, years, or days before a misunderstanding might happen that would boost the public belief that a system is not uh, nuclear armed um, in order to build trust around that issue. But once it's in the air, there's not enough time for open source to do to do much on discriminating. And, and that is an, an inherently, um, stabilizing question, which some states believe they need. Um, but uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't think open source is much help at that point. 
Many thanks, Melissa. Uh, we have another question, something you may have uh, referred a little bit already. It's on the risks also uh, created by uh, OSIN, but this time more thinking about how uh, revealing information can have, can have strategic, strategic consequences. Uh, and so uh, what ways can be uh, taken to mitigate such risk? Like, I think you have uh, already alluded a little bit to that, but you can maybe uh, emphasize it a, a little bit. Uh, then we have two questions really related to the hate code of conduct as a confidence uh, building measures. Uh, the, the first one is, I, I think, uh, um, tends to, to question the role such a mechanism can have in a context where some more um, uh, constraining arms control agreements, especially uh, on um, missiles with uh, intermediate range or short range, uh, are no uh, no longer really working, or on some theaters where they are not uh, applied. Uh, so, what can be the roles of, of such uh, transparency mechanisms and, and confidence building measures? Uh, and a question also on the uh, position of China vis-à-vis uh, -vis the code, vis-à-vis -vis transparency, and I think on, on the question of missiles, of course. The, Context uh, we know and, and Katarzyna talked about is quite interesting because the, the question of transparency on this particular system is rather interesting. Uh, and then we have a, an interesting comment uh, that uh, that is drawing a parallel between the use of OSIN by citizens to monitor uh, jihadist activities. Uh, uh, so uh, Eloise Faye from IFRI uh, is noting that it's something that is quite popular among, amongst intelligence services and useful to complete their own analysis. Um, and there is no competition between the two. So wondering if this uh, kind of uh, way to, to proceed and, and uh, methodology could be also applied in the proliferation field and how we can compare a little bit the two uh, domains. So I, I let you once again pick up in that if you have any uh, remarks or uh, comments. Uh, Katarzyna, you can start. So I will maybe start with the question about um, utilizing the code um, as part of the arms control portfolio to basically answer, address INF, SRBM and MD in Europe and in the Pacific. Uh, well, obviously, the, the code is about transparency and confidence building measures. And I am not sure if we should conflate or extend its scope just because other arms control measures disappeared, were dissolved or, or um, ended their life at this moment. I feel we need to separate separate the kind of role the Hague, Hague Code of Conduct has in the remaining um, security architecture we still have. And then think about how we can address threats that come from having INF range missiles, SRBMs, uh, and missile defense, because there are also completely different fears which underpin the existence of these weapon systems, uh, different doctrines of uh, possibly utilizing them. Uh, and obviously, the code cannot serve as a verification for any arms control agreement in this sense. So I feel we probably should not try to conflate, uh, you know, the aid code being able to deliver what other tools haven't. And we should not try to pressure more into it than it already has. Instead, we should probably try to strengthen it by um, enlarging its scope and, and especially enlarging its membership. And in parallel, uh, you know, start conversations about, you know, what type of measures we could uh, put on the table uh, to minimize our fears, which relate to INF, SRBMs, missile defenses, but also the possible consequences of use of these tools uh, should a conflict um, escalate and, and these tools being used. Um, so again, I would try not to, uh, not to conf conflate uh, uh, these two. Many things. Melissa, what I think is quite interesting in the discussion we're having is that uh, when we think about the use of OSINT uh, and the problems, the potential risks, it can apply to many uh, subjects. But here we are uh, using it for missiles. It's kind of a, a symptomatic example of the risk and the advantages it has. It is an object that is uh, that has a very large political implications, whether a state develops these systems, use these systems, uh, there is a, a connotation, a strong political connotation uh, associated with that. So I think it's quite interesting really to, to uh, explore the risks, which are probably similar for other 
uh, in other domains and in other uh, kind of activities, but really to, to make the connection with the, the, the missiles as well. Yeah, um, missile sites are very interesting in that they are so distinctive from other types of military sites and they have very visible signatures on satellite imagery that can truly help us understand where they are, um, what types of activities take place there and when they are in use. Um, so missiles have really been at the forefront of OSINT in arms control. Um, I think every time a missile test happens out of North Korea or um, uh, even engine tests in Iran, the movement of vehicles uh, in Europe uh, and in Russia, all of these types of activities are very visible by satellite. And so it really has captured the public's attention. Um, much more than a way than, let's say, biological or chemical weapons, which happen in uh, large boxy factory kinds of activities in locations and, and are, are more maybe difficult to discriminate in an obvious way um, from regular industry. But um, I think that uh, um, missile uh, based open source uh, also means that um, there's a lot more people who are perhaps learning in real time what they see in an image is different than how a missile works. There's still a lot of room for developing the expertise, the, the, the aerodynamics, the physics, um, the, the actual technical knowledge of how missiles work. We have seen um, a few slip ups in media, for example, um, uh, newspapers claiming that Iran had erected a um, ICBM ready for launch when in fact it was just a, a tube on a gantry um, you know, that was already there. Fortunately, you know, these things have not really caused any real emergency or crisis because they're so easy to uh, set right in the in a in the matter of a few days, and the uh, open source community is nimble enough to do that. Um, but uh, I I think missiles and open source have really gone hand in hand as um, as the the trade craft has evolved. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Narcissa, you wanted to, to jump in, please, please go ahead. If I may, I mean, I know I'm not part of the panel, but I just wanted to, to comment upon uh, the Hcock and uh, to fully support uh, Katarzyna's uh, comments, uh, not, not to conflate uh, this uh, transparency and um, SEM uh, uh, mechanism with the uh, uh, and, and fully formed arms control regime uh, with the verification system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I wanted to say that you know, for, for the EU, um, transparency has been an sort of an organizing principle. Uh, we are so used to uh, what everything that the transparency implies, you know, the responsibility that you take for your act, for the actions, for for uh, um, the positions that uh, uh, we always make public. But it's not the same for everybody. So this uh, code. While voluntary in its nature, it encourages uh, uh, all states to participate and benefit from reciprocity in this uh, in this area to better understand how transparency works and how it fosters understanding. It fosters trust. It, for, it fosters uh, uh, expertise because, in the end, you will be forced to understand those notifications that uh, that you're reading upon. Uh, so we, we do see it as a very complex vehicle, although it's not a fully fledged uh, arms control document uh, as uh, we have had in the case of uh, INF uh, treaty, for instance. But just to say, to, to once again underline that the transparency is uh, uh, paramount to advancing uh, on all type of activities uh, aiming at uh, limiting, uh, capping, uh, controlling, managing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a prerequisite for all the other uh, steps needed uh, to further advance uh, in, in our goals here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Um, we're going to finish with a, a comment and, and two, maybe two additional questions. Uh, Raymond Ralil uh, from the Access in Jordan is reminding us that uh, the most recent version of the WMD free zone in the Middle East calls for a ban on delivery vehicles. So we could wonder to what extent that some of the uh, techniques that are referred in the paper could be used for, for the verification. And uh, Claudia Brockman from CIPRI uh, is asking, where do you see the limitations of open source intelligence in verifying the specific notifications and declarations, launch notification, missile program, space launch programs that subscribing states uh, submit uh, under the uh, A code of conduct? Uh, is OSINT too targeted to be seen as a societal uh, verification measure for the A code uh, at large? So a very uh, specific question uh, on the code as well. And I will also uh, add a question of my own because that's something I've been thinking a little bit all along uh, listening to you. Some of the uh, techniques you uh, mentioned, uh, both uh, here and, and in the papers, uh, require some technical scientific background to be really exploited, understood and, and uh, uh, used at, at their maximum potential. Um, and I wanted to have maybe your feedback on what you've heard, felt, uh, maybe Melissa as well in, in your previous experience and how we can uh, both increase the technical background of the analysts that are already in the field, um, but also make sure we can bring some uh, scientific expert in in those uh, in this discussion. So I think we can uh, finish with those uh, three uh, remarks. Uh, Katarzyna, if you want, you can start if you're ready. Your take. Yes, thank you, Manuel. I will try to. Um... I hope I will not forget everything, but I will maybe start with the question about from from uh, Kolya about the limitations of open source intelligence. Um, I, I think there are a lot of limitations and they start already with the fact that, you know, the public does not necessarily has the baseline information needed to verify. And this is why I'm not speaking about verifying, really, because you have to have public access to these declarations and notifications in order to be able to verify anything. Um, but if we are speaking in a very like hypothetical theoretical sphere, uh, obviously the limitations and, and Melissa alluded to them already are you know the question of resources, like how many you know people how many data uh, access you have in order to be able to to do this type of monitoring and and investigating uh, work. Uh, so far, we also see. Um, it's not a limit it's, it's just a natural development of how and where most of this work. Uh, is currently settled and it's obviously currently mainly in the US or the English speaking um, environment. And um, there was a, a question, you know, other other groups in Russia or China doing similar stuff. And this is a very valid question. To be frank, I have no idea, so I don't want to, to, uh, to, to say anything. But the sheer fact that we, you know, should think of having um, a, a more systematic um, um, diversity of people all around the globe doing similar work, taking into consideration you know, cultural differences, language, uh, specifications, and so forth and so forth, would definitely um, um, enlarge the pot of knowledge we can generate out of this data and the tools. Uh, and obviously, Melissa also already mentioned legal and ethical uh, issues. Uh, but, but what I would like to also maybe just say at the end to kind of round everything up is that, you know, transparency will increasingly render state secret uh, obsolete in a sense or very difficult at least so the question is really about you know how governments are going to reshape their diplomatic toolkit also to be able to kind of manage this new information sphere and still doing their job uh, there was also a question you know about strategic implications of having you know disclosures of information that could have a strategic effect and it's a very valid question because i i you know, there are definitely a lot of inf situations in which government pre governments prefer not to uh, make some information public because they prefer to deal with the issues, you know, below the table, behind the curtain or whatever. And obviously this will get increasingly complicated. So it's really about reshaping the diplomatic toolkit uh, we are having in our, uh, to our disposal and basically kind of stepping out of the dark if you want, because the dark, the light is getting lighter and lighter. And the question is, you know, how good of, of preparation are we going to be, you know, when the sun sets in full motion and there will be no options to hide anymore or very difficult. 
Thank you very much. Melissa, I give you the floor and there is also a, a remark on a book doc documentation that uh, may address those topics. So please feel free also to refer to some, to, to do some shameless publicity if you have also some recommendations uh, on those topics because you've worked really extensively. Well, I, I really don't think I should have the last word on this. Katarzyna's worked so hard on this paper, but um, uh, I do, I, I would recommend Katarzyna's paper to read. Um, and uh, there's also, um, depending on your interest, um, information from Bellingcat, the Center for Nonproliferation Studies, um, uh, FRS has, of course, got a, a whole range of, of, of papers on HCOC itself. Um, with regard to kind of professionalizing the tradecraft, there are um, some people who are working to create texts and training materials for students or for trainees who want to do that. I'm one of them, and uh, there will be a workbook coming out in a few weeks um, in a series of workshop training sessions on handling ethical dilemmas. So not so much on the technical um, side, but on the ethical side. Um, to Emmanuel's question, um, we definitely need to invite more scientists and engineers into this political space in order to do open source well and effectively, just as is the case when we are handling classified information. Um, I think we can see that that's possible when we look at the International Atomic Energy Agency and elsewhere where comprehensive test ban treaty organization where scientists and diplomats work hand in hand. That also needs to happen. And it does happen uh, in the open source. Um, but I, I do recommend promoting a kind of scientific literacy um, in policy-based schools so that students are not just a uh, policy memo is for a government, but also learning you know, the, the basics of um, statistical knowledge, um, you know, the correlation and causation and, and feel literate when they um, handle some of the assertions that are made. Um, uh, but I'll leave it at that and, and please uh, give Katarzyna the last word. <laughs> With pleasure. So I don't know, Katarzyna, if you have uh, something to add. And uh, Narcissa, of course, please feel free to jump in if you have uh, closing uh, remarks. So maybe I would just use the opportunity to say one more time very thank you to FRS and to you, Emmanuel. Thank you to uh, Narcisa. Thank you to the European Union. And thank you to you, Melissa. It was really a fascinating discussion. Um, and again I, I hope that the field can grow as there is a lot of untapped potential and the, the only question which is there is really are we going to use it wisely thank you thank you also from my side it was a uh, very very interesting discussion I learned a lot so thanks a lot for uh, for your uh, work at Regina and Melissa for your uh, always very wise uh, and informative comments thank you Emmanuel and the team for this uh, for this webinar Many thanks uh, to, to all of you, many thanks for your presence to this uh, webinar. Uh, and of course, these subjects are issues that we're going to keep uh, working on at FRS. We have uh, uh, papers that are going to uh, be published very soon, also on our, our website. So you'll find all this work, uh, this, uh, the recording of this webinar as well on the new webpage. So please feel free to, to browse it. And with that, I'm, uh, I'm going to close the, the session for today. Uh, many thanks again and all the best for the rest of your day. Bye-bye.